This video attempts to visualize an early American 8th Air Force mission that took place in 1943 on June 13. This is Horsham St. Faith, a grass airfield in England. All three squadrons of the 56th Fighter Group have been here for two months. Most of these planes are P-47C Thunderbolts. U.S. reporters referred to the 56th as Zemke's Group, named after its commanding officer. The press couldn't use the name 56th Fighter Group for security reasons. Later on, the press came up with the name Zemke's Wolf Pack. Hubert Zemke was a Montana State champion boxer. He left the University of Montana in 1936 for a career path in the U.S. Army Air Corps. He graduated from flying school in 1937. He flew P-40s, P-39s, and the British version of the P-38. In 1941, he transferred to England as an Air Corps observer, along with Lieutenant Johnny Allison. When the British gave up on the Tomahawk and sent them to Russia, Zemke and Allison went to Russia to train pilots. After the U.S. entered the war, Zemke transferred back to the U.S. and wound up in the 56th Fighter Group, where he was quickly promoted to CO. The 56 trained in the U.S. in 1942 flying P-47Bs and was in England by January of 1943, where they received new P-47Cs. The 56 flew the first combat mission with the 4th Fighter Group on 8 April 1943. By 9 May of 1943, the 56 had lost two of their own in combat and had shot down two aircraft. Unfortunately, the aircraft they shot down were Spitfires, so the 56 had no victories after two months of combat. This is Hub Zemke's aircraft. Three fighter squadrons made up the 56th fighter group. They were the 61st, the 62nd, and the 63rd. Zemke alternated mission lead with Major Mac McCollum, who had been the CO of the 61st fighter squadron. The 4th and 78th fighter groups were more successful than the 56th, and Zemke felt pressure to achieve results to avoid being replaced. So Zemke tended to lead a larger share of the missions. Zemke and McCollum would rotate which of the three squadrons they led on any given mission. Usually all three squadrons went on each mission. Zemke was constantly trying to instill discipline in his pilots, who tended to be an inexperienced, carefree lot. They were, however, capable flyers with an aggressive spirit. Zemke deliberately distanced himself from his squadron leaders to achieve an awareness of command. The Pocket Wolf 190 and the P-47 were the only radial engine fighters in the ETO. The white bands helped differentiate the two. When the P-47s arrived in England, RAF and 4th Fighter Group pilots weren't too impressed with the big radial engine aircraft. Bob Johnson loved it. Hub Zemke not so much. The Mark V Spitfire pilot said the P-47 was too big, a sitting duck. German fighters would fly circles around it. It was suicide to fly below 15,000 feet against 190s and 109s. Bob Johnson in his book also made a big deal about how tough the yellow-nosed Abbeville boys were. Luftwaffe pilots were flattered and amused when they heard about this from captured airmen. They considered their success more Darwinian than anything else. Johnson didn't lose faith in the P-47, really sang its praises for roll, dive, zoom climb, especially the paddle blade version although Johnson only flew the Razorbacks. 
He also liked the firepower and the ruggedness. There's Horsham St. Faith. It was scheduled to be rebuilt as a bomber base, so the 56 was destined to be there for only one more month. Earlier in April, there were more pilots than planes in the 56, with 12 planes per squadron per mission. So pilots didn't get to fly every mission. By the end of May, there were 16 planes per squadron per mission, and near equal pilots and planes. Second Lieutenant Bob Johnson sometimes had to sit on the ground, or he was a frustrated spare pilot taking off with the group and having to turn back when no one boarded. At this time, contact with the Luftwaffe averaged about once in every five missions. Ramrods, bomber escorts, brought them up more often than rodeos, fighter sweeps. This mission was a fighter sweep. The mission began at Horsham St. Faith, takeoff was at 9 a.m., and proceeded to Gravelines, France, which the Americans probably called Gravelines, then to Bailu, Belgium, Altra, and finally Naka at the coast. The American Air Museum states the 4th Fighter Group also went to Gravelines that day, but it must have been at a different time. Between the 4th and the 56, 96 P-47s in total participated. The 78th Fighter Group also did a sweep late in the afternoon and saw separate action that day. On the previous day, June 12th, McCollum led 48 aircraft of the 62nd Fighter Squadron on a sweep. Near Austin, near the coast, Captain Walter Cook of the 62nd shot down an FW-190 to give the 56th Fighter Group its first confirmed victory. Today, Zemke leads the 56. Normally, he would have led from the front of the middle squadron and I assume the squadrons would not be mixed. Most senior pilots had their own plane assigned to them, and by June, they were painting names on their aircraft. First Lieutenant Joe Curtis flew Snow White. At this time, he was normally Mac McCollum's wingman. There was a whole flight of 61st P-47s with seven dwarf characters, and the 67 used Lil Abner characters, one of the three cartoons in Stars and Stripes military newspaper. This is Doc Renwick's aircraft. He was a flight leader in July. Let's see if we can hear the turbo supercharger. P-47s had the largest radial engine in the ETO, the Pratt & Whitney R-2800. It had approximately 2,000 horsepower. Later, the P-47s were modified to use water injection as war emergency power to boost the horsepower to 2300. And a new paddle blade propeller really improved the rate of climb. P-47s originally could go from 0 to 30,000 feet in 20 minutes, and that was improved to 13 minutes. Range was an issue for the fuel-thirsty P-47s. I know a lot of people have talked about that. Here's a list of things that I've found that affected P-47 range in the ETO. Every time the 56 fighter group was ordered to move to a new airfield closer to the fighting, Zemke protested it as it disrupted group efficiency. P-47Cs weren't built with drop tank shackles, although I think they were later modified in the field. But they were ferried with an unpressurized drop tank. On the 28th of July, 1943, 200-gallon unpressurized auxiliary fuel tanks were being used by the 4th fighter group extending flight duration by 30 minutes. The unpressurized tanks had to be dropped above 20,000 feet, earlier than desired. The average P-47 flight time in August of 1943 was only 80 minutes. At the end of August, a 75-gallon pressurized belly drop tank was being used for the first time. These tanks could be completely drained before being dropped since they were pressurized. Flight duration with the new tanks was a record 2 hours and 40 minutes. A couple months later, on the 4th of October 1943, the first mission was flown with a British-made 108-gallon belly drop tank. A couple weeks later, on the 18th of October, the first drop tanks went to the 4th and 78th fighter groups, not the 56. Zemke complained that only 75-gallon and no 108-gallon tanks were available for the 56. P-47 Endurance was also extended using fuel conservation techniques from 3 to 3 and a quarter hours using the 108-gallon drop tank. 
Later, aircraft were sent to a depot to install wing pylons. It took 10 days to a month before the aircraft were returned. The pylons also reduced speed by 10 miles per hour. Meanwhile, while the wing tanks were being added, on the 20th of February 1944, a 150-gallon belly drop tank was used. A month later in March, two 108-gallon drop tanks were used under the wings to give a flight duration of four hours. A P-47D was limited to one and a half flying hours on internal fuel, which was at that time 305 gallons. More internal fuel capacity was later added to the P-47s, but that didn't happen until May of 44. And at that time, the 56 only had three D-25 Superbolts with the larger internal fuel tank. Second Lieutenant Johnson was always tail end Charlie in the early missions. I think that refers to him being in the number four slot, although he also complained about being the last one to fly over the coast. At least there's no flack. Bob Johnson, like Zemke, was into boxing. This probably worked in his favor as a combat pilot, along with his experience playing football and hunting with a 22 rifle and an assortment of larger guns. He had great eyesight, the best in the 61st Fighter Squadron. Bob was obsessed with flying since being a child, and he managed to solo at the age of 14. He had quite a bit of flight time when he signed up with the U.S. Army Air Corps. Johnson was flying as number four in Gabreski's top cover flight. Gabreski came into the group with seniority from Polish RAF squadron. As a captain, he displaced another flight leader in the 56, causing some initial resentment. By the time of this mission, Gabreski had replaced McCollum as CO of the 61st. Bob Johnson was actually in the 56 a few months before both Zemke and Gabreski. According to Johnson, the 56th flew right-hand finger four formations. Five miles from the French coast, Zemke would call for battle formation. The squadrons slid apart, line abreast, 100 yards apart, wing to wing. Later, Johnson described it as 200 yards, 500 yards between flights, 1,500 yards between squadrons. The middle squadron was lower with top cover 3,000 feet higher, and the third squadron was slightly higher than the middle squadron. Roger Freeman in The Mighty Eighth describes what happened next. At 27,000 feet, some 12 FW-190s were sighted 7,000 feet below and climbing northwest from the direction of Ypres. Donald Caldwell in JG-26 wrote, The FW pilots from 10 JG-26 were taken by surprise. Other sources claim the Vaca Wolves were from another unit. Freeman continues, Colonel Zemke immediately took two flights of the 61st Fighter Squadron into a dive to attack a four-plane enemy flight. Johnson in the book Thunderbolt describes the action as follows. Another pilot and I thrashed out the events of the day. I was disgusted. Once before we'd been in position for a perfect bounce and an excellent chance for a kill. He and I had flown together since our first meeting in advanced training at Kelly Field. By assignment, we alternated between leader or wingman positions. Sometimes he led and I flew his wing, then we changed. After losing out on what seemed a sure kill, we decided not to let this happen again. Bob, he said, the next time you see any bandits below us, don't wait. Just go on and bounce the nearest son of a bitch. Never mind who's leading. 
If you're flying wing and you see them first, call them out and go. I'll cover your wing. Whoever gets first crack will be covered by the other guy, okay? It sounded good to me. We grinned and shook hands on our new agreement. The next day, we passed over 12 Focke-Wolfs in tight formation. My cohort held the number three position in Gabreski's flight, and I flew the number four slot, protecting his wing. We were top cover for the day, but I couldn't have cared less. There were fighters below us. Twelve bandits, I shouted, right below us. I kicked rudder and banged the stick over, diving after the Germans. Come on, I called. Let's get him. I didn't need to look back. That's why my buddy was there. I knew he'd be glued to my wing, protecting me against any stern attack. The thunderbolt fell through and streaked earthward. Everything was fitting into place as the Focke-Wolf expanded in size, as details of the wings and fuselage came into view. Freeman continues. Zemke, approaching the rearmost number four enemy aircraft, apparently undetected from astern, started firing at 200 yards, and a second later the FW burst into flames. He then opened fire on the number three in the formation and noted strikes on the wingtip. The surprised German immediately dived away, placing Zemke directly astern of the next man in the enemy formation. Another burst exploded this aircraft. Meanwhile, First Lieutenant Joe Curtis fired at another Focke-Wolf, damaging it. Johnson in the book Thunderbolt describes the action as follows. The German attack formation loomed larger every second, and still they hadn't moved. Still they hadn't seen us. Now they had. Look at them go. Black crossed fighters breaking in all directions, flashing away from the plummeting Thunderbolt that was now so close. I wanted the leader, the number one man, and I wasn't going to lose him today. I lifted the wing, slid the P-47 through a gentle curve in her dive, and lunged for the Fock Wolf. Closer, closer, the square wings, big black crosses in the sights, growing larger, clearer. Everything seemed to be so familiar. Was this combat or another mock battle with a friend? I did everything as I always had, flying exactly as I had in the wild, friendly dogfights over Connecticut and over England, following the same procedures learned through practice. I didn't think that this was a Fock Wolf, or that the man inside was a German or that if he managed to whirl that black crossed airplane around, then four cannon and two heavy guns would be hurling steel and explosives at me. I talked to myself. Nope, you're too close. Pick her nose up just a little. That's it, just a little higher. That's it, just a little higher. There, hold for a second, hold it. Something hit me. The thunderbolt trembled so violently my finger flew from the trigger, and the explosion stopped. My own guns! All that noise and vibration, the flame and smoke had come from the eight heavy 50 calibers blasting away. I was so scared I nearly jumped out of my seat, and... Violent flame! A sudden mushrooming flower of jagged pieces of metal twisting crazily, black smoke. There goes the Fock wolf torn into pieces from my first burst. First kill. I'd made it. The thunderbolt flashed through a spinning torrent of fire, smoke, and debris. The remains of the disintegrating FW-190. 
The thunderbolt howled and went for altitude, bursting away from any pursuers that might have charged after me. I was alone. I kicked the rudder pedals, swinging my head about, searching for my wingman. Where the blazes was he? This wasn't any joke. I had made a grave error by taking a bounce by myself. Back at the field I discovered through the almost violent anger of my commanding officer exactly what he thought of my little maneuver. I got chewed up, but thoroughly. My friend was no help. No sooner did we land than he was in the colonel's office complaining bitterly that I had abandoned him in the air in the middle of a dogfight just because I wanted to kill. The only kill I wanted at that moment was to have that guy's neck in my hands. He'd never even been in a fight. He never even broke formation. It was a good day for the 56, even if I was forced to walk a tightrope back at the base and to suffer being chewed out again and again. Hub Zemke had gunned down two of the Focke-Wolfs, and my kill made three for the day, which put the outfit in business. Oh well, despite my being racked by Zemke and the rest, it was worth it. I tried to justify my action to myself, I just couldn't keep from going after the Jerrys. After all, we were there to fight. My new flight leader, Gerald W. Johnson, was especially sour about my actions of the day. He congratulated me on the kill, and then nearly tore my head off with, with a beautiful chewing out. From Donald Caldwell, the 10th Staffel lost one pilot killed and a second wounded. Jerry Johnson would be the group's first ace. Zemke was its second. For what it's worth, I think it's interesting that two sources, and maybe they're related to the same source, but Roger Freeman in the Mighty Eighth and Morrison Aces and Wingmen claim that Bob Johnson's first aircraft was named All Hell and not Half Pint, although his next P-47 they say was named Half Pint. In addition to the reprimands, Bob received a bottle of scotch from General Spots. It was signed by everyone in the outfit, and Bob kept it for decades. Zemke learned some lessons that day. Zemke had not called down the top cover, but recognized he should have. There were problems with excessive radio usage. It was resolved that squadron leaders and flight leaders should use their own initiative to decide when to attack. Altitude advantage and surprise were key. Later, when he led flights, Bob Johnson put into practice that any one of the four pilots in his flight, upon sighting German fighters, was free immediately to bounce, while the other three members protected the attack. Bob Johnson never lost a wingman to an enemy fighter. On the next mission, Johnson swore, the Krauts are going to have to shoot me out of formation. In his book, Bob Johnson wrote he was in the number four position of Jerry Johnson's flight on the 26th of June, 1943, when they were surprised from above. Bob was hit and claimed he later counted 21 cannon shell holes and tears. He escaped the 190s on fire, nearly bailed out, and was flying back to England when a German pilot pulls up alongside him, waves or salutes, only to drop in behind him to shoot him up with machine guns, repeating this a total of three times before giving up, amazed that the P-47 is still flying. Johnson wrote, every square foot, it seems, is covered with holes. I don't actually see that kind of damage in these photos. Freeman mentioned in one of his earlier books, The Mighty Eighth, well, he mentioned Egan Meyer's name in connection with this incident. But 15 years later, he refuted that, apparently, in Wolfpack Warriors with Jerry Johnson's version of the June 26 event. Jerry was the last one back from the mission and heard Bob Johnson's story and said nothing, although he thought that in his excitement, Bob had let his imagination run away. Here's Jerry's version. German fighters. There are a lot of them, and they are higher than we are. I'm watching them, and they're coming around, and we are sitting ducks. I can't wait any longer, so I called break left. So my flight breaks left and we went around and met them head on. Got out of this mess and tried to find somebody to shoot at, but couldn't see anybody. I remember thinking, where the hell have they all gone? They were here seconds ago. The people who were my flight, they're all gone. I'm by myself. Finally, I begin to see stragglers around. A lot of conversation on the radio with people sounding as if they were scared to death. Then I saw a P-47 headed back to England with a fox wolf on his tail shooting at him. The P-47 is flying straight and level. I'm a little higher. I roll around, come in on the Focke-Wolf, 
Just as I'm about to open fire, he sees me, breaks off, but I'm too close. And I shoot and get hits all over, and he breaks off in a fireball. The P-47 that was being shot at seemed to be okay, so I turned back into France to try to find another German to shoot at. But I don't find any, and according to my fuel gauges, I'd better be heading back. So I'm one of the last fellows to land. It turns out that the airplane I saw being shot up was Bob Johnson. He had already told this fantastic story about how the German pilot had come up alongside and so on. That's the end of Jerry Johnson's version of what happened. By the end of June, the group had six kills, but they had also lost five of their own. Here's a view of Horsham St. Faith, the airfield in 1946, with concrete runways. Bob Johnson described it when he first saw it in April of 1943 as dozens of barrage balloons drifting from cables near the airstrip with long, deep grass for a runway. The 56th Fighter Group was there from April to July of 1943 before moving to Halesworth and later to Boxted. These markings are typical for May and June of 1943. Little Butch was McCollum's aircraft. Here's Hub Zemke. I think it was Roger Freeman who described Zemke's P-47 the following. It was a C-5, serial number 416330, LMZ, and Zemke flew it from March to October of 1943. The name Boy Tovarish was added by 14 May 1943. Two crosses were added after the 13 June incident. It had a yellow surround on the fuselage emblem and two oversized emblems on the undersides of the wings. It was heavily waxed. The name and crosses were later removed. It never had any bars on the U.S. emblem. By the fall of 1943, the 56th Fighter Group thought that they were the best. The 56th achieved 102 victories by Sadie Hawkins Day, a group goal and another reference to the Lil Abner comic strip. At the time, the 56th had twice as many victories as any other group in the 8th Air Force. In the photo, Bob Johnson's on the left, Hub Zemke's in the middle, and Bud Mahuren is on the right. He was the first double ace in the 56th and the first ETO ace to reach 20 victories. On the 15th of March, 1944, Bob Johnson passed Bud Mahuren with 22 aerial victories. Somewhere around April or May, Bob Johnson was transferred from the 61st to the 62nd Fighter Squadron. Bob left the European theater as a major in May of 1944 at the age of 23 with 27 aerial victories after completing his 200-hour combat tour with 150-hour extension. He was sent back to the States to tour and be with his new wife. Gabby Gabreski went on to fly for two more months and in July surpassed Bob Johnson's record with 28 aerial victories, becoming the top American ETO ace. The 56th score of enemy aircraft was unsurpassed by any other American group in Europe, and it also had the best ratio of aircraft destroyed to losses, 8 to 1. German fighter pilot quality began to noticeably deteriorate around early spring of 1944. Zemke felt the earlier achievements of the 56 were all the more significant because they were against higher quality pilots. Well, that's the end of my story. Have a nice day.